Hello, my name is Dr. Liam Schubel, and welcome to another edition of Schubel Vision Elite Interviews, where today we'll be interviewing Dr. Tom Gilardi, the founder of Sherman College of Chiropractic, and I'm joined here with my friend Dr. Frankie Hahn and Dr. Judd O'Grady of the Schubel Vision Elite Team. Enjoy the interview. Hello and welcome. My name is Dr. Liam Schubel and you're watching the Schubel Vision exclusive interview with our guest today, Dr. Tom Gilardi, the founder of Sherman College of Chiropractic. And Dr. Tom, we're going to start from the beginning. Hello. <laughs> Where were you born and how did life lead you to going to chiropractic college? Okay. I was born in Mount Vernon, New York, not that far from here. Right. And... Um, I guess it was my very poor health at that time that I spent my first eight birthdays in the hospital. But I was in and out. But one time I was there for two and a half years without leaving the hospital. I was in bed, not even on walking around for two and a half years. Uh, and then after that, I had to live a very restricted life. Started with rheumatic fever and then went into a heart murmur. Or bacterial endocarditis, and then into a, a murmur, and couldn't play sports. Had a special bus pick me up and take me to school. Wasn't allowed to climb stairs, and so on. Missed quite a bit of school in those early years. But then after that, about every year or two, I'd be back in the hospital. Always something with bad health. So uh, then my brother-in-law, who had uh, he was in World War II. He was an officer, a Navy officer. And after the war, he started a little business of his own and developed migraine headaches. Then he was called back during the Korean War. And they put him in Bethesda Hospital for the migraine headaches. And he was excited about all the things that they were able to do for him, except none of them worked. And he still had his migraine headaches. But when he came out, some of his friends, said, we're going to take you to a chiropractor. And chiropractor was illegal at that time. They were putting chiropractors in jail. But he had been very much helped by chiropractic. In fact, he'd never had headaches after that. Uh, so he was after me or encouraging me to see a chiropractor. And I just couldn't see how, I could see maybe headaches or maybe neck pain or back pain but not a heart condition. I had a valve problem by this time. So uh, I just refused to go, but he kept after me for a couple of years. Finally, just to satisfy him, I went to a chiropractor. And uh, what the chiropractor said to me and what he did was so exciting to me uh, that it was not the, I had been to dozens of medical doctors and always went through the same routine. Well, here he didn't have a stethoscope and that was just something different and wasn't really that interested in my heart condition. And when he explained about how the body strives to heal itself, something I had never verbalized, but always believed in some way, at some level, it was the most exciting thing I've heard. And plus, I said, you know, there were three things that really excited me. One is he looked like a regular person. I don't know what I expected, but I just was <laughs> frightened to go and had heard all these horror stories. In every medical doctor's office, there was a little pamphlet called What Price Your Life? Telling how chiropractors were diagnosing something and it was something else and people were dying in their hands and so on. So anyway, all I, he looked fine. And he spoke very intelligently. But what he said was just something I wanted to hear, that the body was striving to heal itself. And that made all the sense in the world. And the third thing was he was affordable. And it was at that time a donation, or you just discussed it with him, what you could afford to pay. And so I could afford to go uh, to him. So uh, I didn't see any fantastic results the first year. It was a whole year. but I was the first time I had not been in the hospital. For the first time in my life, I went without taking medicine. I just quit my medicine the first day. Oh, I wow. just had never, in fact, I have not had a drop, of, I hadn't had an aspirin 
since that first adjustment. Wow. And I've never missed a day of work since that wow. first adjustment. Uh, so it was, but I didn't, I still had problems. Uh, but, and they were so subtle, the difference in me, the only thing I could go by was, well, I wasn't hospitalized this year. Uh, but I could go and continue going to a chiropractor. I thought about being a chiropractic, studying chiropractic. But it was, I think, Dr. Marcus Bach in the book, The Chiropractic Story, he says, swinging like a pendulum. It certainly does make sense. But don't you think medicine would have discovered it in that amount of time, you know? Mm -hmm. So I went back and forth, liking chiropractic, but afraid that maybe if it was so good, why wasn't it more popular? Right. So I decided not to when I started the university after I graduated high school. But then something kept gnawing at me that I had to be a chiropractor. I asked my chiropractor, where might I study chiropractic? And they, at that time, there were three chiropractic colleges in Manhattan. And it's funny that they were allowed under some law to teach because that was they couldn't stop them from teaching. And the interns could practice. Once they graduated, it was illegal. <laughs> it was, you know, that was also bizarre. It's like a fantasy football league. <laughs> and his diploma, and I don't remember the school, which one of the three schools, but it was on his diploma, qualified to practice straight chiropractic, hmm. right on the diploma. And he said it was a very good school, and he would recommend it to me. And then he said something that, if you want the best, he said that would be Palmer. Yeah. He's, he did postgraduate work there. And uh, he said that would be the best. So, uh, and I thought then too, and thought later, I wanted the best. I didn't know where Palmer was located, but I just knew that if I was going to be a chiropractor, why not train at the best school available if I could get into it? So we decided on Palmer. So I hear students say, well, I'm studying at this college because they're close to the ocean and I like the ocean right. or this is a big city or they have a good football team. And I think about, you know, if I was going to be a pianist or any, yeah. particularly in the arts, I'd want to study under the best. Right. And I'm glad I did go to Palmer. I had a good education. But that's how I, quick story. Not now, quick. now the, so you go to Palmer uh, in Davenport and uh, was B.J. Palmer running the school at that point? Yes, he okay. was about 75 years old, wow. I believe. Uh, but he was not in great health. He had worked so much and did so much. He wasn't in great health, but he was there. And he gave special lectures wow. to classes. So I we went to a num number of those lectures. Always, never miss, would miss him. And hear him at Lyceum. their are Lyceum times. And so... Uh, so you really were studying with the best. Oh, yes, yeah. yes. And now you had in your uh, your class, I believe, had had a lot of you know big names in chiropractic that we probably recognize. Who who are some yes. of the folks that were that were in class with you? Well, you know, Jerry McAndrews was in my class. Mm -hmm. He became president of Palmer, and he was later, I think, became head of the ICA, the International Chiropractors mm -hmm. Association. Uh, so he was then Reggie Gold was at school with me. He was, I think, a little bit behind me, even though he was older, but he went to chiropractic later than I did. Uh, Joe Felicia. Oh, wow. He was there. Uh, Sid Williams. Dr. Sid Williams mm -hmm. who started Life College and uh, his wife, Nell. I didn't know Nell at that time. I knew Sid and attended because he was lecturing at that time also. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Tom, wh who were some of your teachers there that, that we might know? Okay. Of course, in the first quarter of philosophy, the one that excites you the most is, um, and that was Herbert Himes. Wow. He yeah. was, then we went to Galen Price. Oh, and, this uh, is fantastic. Yeah, Galen, yeah. and Herbert was excellent, very, very good. Uh, and a lot of the instructors would always in, relate their subject to chiropractic, uh, and that was fine. Then... Dr. Kronk, a famous chiropractic family. Okay. Uh, Kronk was related through marriage to Dr. Rutherford, who became oh, yeah. head of the ICA. So you're in in Palmer, and um, as a student, 
what did you find to be the most challenging uh, part of attending Palmer College? I don't think it was unusually challenging. Uh, to me, it was beautiful. I just yeah. loved every minute of it. And there was a lot of memory work. Got it. But things have changed since then where at Palmer, they tried to make it as easy as possible. So there would be a lot of charts and just the crux of that you had to memorize. And you had to know all of the bones and all of the muscles and there's mm -hmm. you know, origin, insertion, and sure. so on. There's a lot to it, but you didn't have to dig for it. It was already in some type of form that was, it took a lot of memory, but yeah. memory was an easy thing at that time. <laughs> okay. And, and was there something else, though, that you found demanding about, about being out there? Finances. Uh, finances. That. <laughs> So something something that everybody can relate to today, right? Yeah. And uh, so the finances, uh, uh, and I know I've heard other Palmer graduates around your time talking about that and having odd jobs and and selling things on in your spare time. What what what, what did you do to to meet the financial challenges? Well, in my first year, it was a lot of selling jobs. Okay, from vacuum cleaners to storm windows, really to knives and so on. Things. But that was very, very good. I learned how to meet people yeah. and uh, attended the company's little sales things about what is important and how do you make a presentation. Got it. So that, that was everything mm -hmm. you do, I guess, mm -hmm. is worth something. But most of my time at Palmer, uh, probably two, two and a half years, I worked on the railroad. Interesting. And uh, I worked from 11 at night to 7 in the morning. Wow. And it was an outside job. So it gets you know, 10 below zero sometimes at night frequently right. in the winter. It's very cold and you're outdoors all the time. There's some barrels with some things burning, wood or so, where you can warm up a little bit. But, uh, and in the summer, it doesn't really cool off uh, in the flatlands as it does sure. uh, near the mountains. So uh, that was a pretty tough job. It was not heavy. But just surviving, and it gave you a good feeling that you survived another day. <laughs> but it was a steady salary, and that was a sketchy life. I guess it made you really look forward to uh, becoming a chiropractor even more, right? It's a, a chiropractic is probably a, 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 a much uh, a much better job than maybe some of those jobs. Well, I loved chiropractic. Yeah. I yeah. just loved chiropractic. Uh, and I think when I was in the health center, you had certain requirements that you had to meet, but I far exceeded them because... Yeah. I just love doing what I was doing. I still do today. <laughs> well, uh, so that's you had the challenging aspect of Palmer, which is the finances. What did you love most about being at Palmer and being a student at Palmer? Obviously, you, you loved the philosophy of chiropractic. Uh, you loved chiropractic, the science, the art of it. Uh, yes. Any other experiences that you, that you said, gosh, I really loved that. I, you know, I missed being there for that reason. Well, when I was going to Palmer, my chiropractor said, I'll only give you one bit of advice. He said, you're going to meet children of chiropractors and people who have been under chiropractic care all their lives. Close your ears to everything and just focus on what the school is giving you. Okay. And don't get all this interference that it's the wrong thing and their chiropractor knew better. Yeah. So uh, I, I followed that advice and it, I think, helped me a great deal. But um, the thing that... I liked the technique, mm -hmm. but the way I saw chiropractic of all the different divisions within the thought processes on different subjects, some were interested in success. That didn't really, I didn't relate to that at all because I just knew I was going to be successful. I yeah. didn't have any question. I was, everyone, why, why should I not be successful? Right. And, right. Uh, so I wasn't concerned at all about success or seminars, success seminars. I didn't think that there was any gimmicks needed to be successful. People come in to have better health. And if you, if I believe strongly that if I corrected the subluxation, they'd have better health. Yeah. So I was very interested in the technique, uh, finding the subluxation and correcting it. That was, to me, the burning thing. I love the philosophy. Uh, it was not a religion. Right. It was just the reasoning of what we were doing chiropractically so and it was a to me a philosophy of life you saw everything in this idea of the philosophy that there's a universal wisdom and to me obedience to the laws of nature uh 
there's that little poem about uh, ships sail east and ships sail west by the very same winds that blow. Mm -hmm. Same universal mm -hmm. laws are out there. Mm -hmm. It's the set of the sail and not the gale that determine where they go. Right, right. <laughs> so uh, I just want to make sure that if I followed universal law, mm -hmm. had my sails set correctly, and I do believe that there's a big difference between an adjustment and just moving vertebra. I don't care what part of the spine you're in. BJ said chiropractic is specific or it's nothing. And I don't relate that to the upper cervical spine. I relate that to any place in the spine that you have got to know what you're doing. Uh, like I say, a problem understood is half resolved. Sure. So, and then I strongly believe in the technique. And so that was to me impressive. So speaking of technique, so th let me ask you this question. Are you an upper cervical uh, toggle practitioner or how would you classify your technique? Uh, and, and, and why did you choose that technique over any other one? Well, I consider myself a full spine. Full spine, okay. And if I look at the spine, I learned this principle that a professional is a person that works with an economy of motion. A writer can say more with the fewest amount of words. A golfer gets where they're going with the least number of strokes. So I think that uh, you don't impress a patient of being a professional by doing more than is necessary. You do only what is necessary. And the less you can do to get the biggest result is more impressive. Not that you're trying to impress the patient, but it just makes more sense. And it doesn't make any more sense to put on a show for the patient. Right. Just get them in, do what you have to do, and do it right. And, uh, and get on with your day and let them get on with their day. So um, I find this. When I look at a spine on all my patients from the day one, on several visits in the beginning, I examine the entire spine. I don't usually adjust the first day unless there's some crisis reason why I should. But I try to get to understand how that person is on various days, when they're resting, when they're sitting up, and I mean, you know, when they're active, and get to understand their spine. And I may find several areas that are not what they should be chiropractic. And um, so then I would say, okay, what would be the main area? Let me adjust the main area and let's see what the body does with the other areas. Mm -hmm. So that is frequently the upper cervical, the way I view it. I find the second most important area is the lower lumbopelvic area. Uh, and I mean, it could be any area in the spine, but those are the two most frequent. So I adjust most frequently upper cervical. Got it. But uh, I look at the, what do they say, think globally, but act locally. Yeah. And so I think globally as far as the spine goes, but I try to act as locally as possible. Got it. Dr. Sherman said something about the um, clinic at Palmer. Is they would ask a patient who came from all over the world to go there, and they're always referred by their own chiropractor. And he said, okay. You wouldn't be here if you didn't think chiropractic had promise. But why are you here? If you why didn't you stay with your the chiropractor? What made you decide to come here? And I said, well, when I started under chiropractic care, my health improved greatly. Uh, and then it seemed like I lost it, and I just thought maybe something I needed more or whatever. But they found that. At Palmer, when they did less, the patient regained and did better with their health. Got it. So. Got it. Um, switching some gears here, uh, your wife, uh, Betty Gilardi, Dr. Betty Gilardi, where did you meet her and how? It was about my last year of school. A friend of mine, his wife, I think, went home to have a baby in Wisconsin. So he and I were going out for dinner one night, and we stopped at a pub, and uh, all the seats were filled, except there were 
seats opposite two young ladies. <laughs> so we asked if we could join them. So they said, fine. And they were nurses from Moline Public Hospital. Wow. And so um, we had dinner there. And I squeezed out of her somehow or other, teased out of her, I should say, <laughs> her phone number so I could call her. So then uh, we gradually met and had a cup of coffee, and then we had a date and so on. Things went on from there. Then when BJ was giving a lecture, uh, I would ask if she could find a way to come to Palmer. And so she did, and she loved BJ. And she heard several of his lectures there mm -hmm. in that Lyceum to that short time. Uh, but I had made up my mind earlier. I said, I am not going to talk chiropractic because I just go too wild when I do. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so when she'd ask a question, I'd just try to answer that question and not go any further than that. <laughs> <laughs> so she saw your love for chiropractic and she accepted you anyway. <laughs> in spite, in spite <laughs> of me. <laughs> of. <laughs> <laughs> then she was on her way out to study post, she did postgraduate work in obstetrics in Jersey City. Oh, wow. And. Uh, in Moline, they were using natural childbirth. When she got to Jersey City, it was kind of like a baby factory. Wow. And she was very disappointed <laughs> in postgraduate work. <laughs> okay, so 1957, you graduated from Palmer Davenport. What were your plans at that point upon graduation? Well, my last year again, Dr. Sherman was the first time I ever heard him speak. He was not teaching at that time. And he came in and gave a special lecture. I liked his lecture. A few of us went up and asked if we could meet with him sometime uh, to answer further questions. Mm -hmm. So he said he practiced in Davenport till nine o'clock at night. And, but was, we set up an appointment with him. He said he'd be glad to see us. So that appointment led to another, another. Uh, and then he told us that he was building a clinic in Spartanburg, South Carolina, and was planning on moving there. And so. Um, Later, I did want to uh, enter practice with him. There was a student in my class who said he was going to be in practice with him. Dr. Sherman had agreed to that, which I found out later wasn't quite that firm an agreement anyway. But then the student said he changed his mind and was going someplace else. And I, if I wanted to practice with him, to contact him. So I did, and Dr. Sherman said, well, he just didn't have enough practice. He just was moving in himself. And not at that time. He wanted to be alone at that time. Later, he asked me if I wanted to join him. But anyway, I wanted to get close to him. Yeah. I was learning so much. And uh, so several years later, he asked if I'd like to join him. But my practice was already up and running, and I had children at that time. Yeah. And, uh, I said, no, I'd just stay where I was. But that's how we ended up in met. that area. So where did you go, go to practice then, right after uh, uh, Davenport? Well, oh, first of all, I had to get some money to get into practice. And uh, Betty didn't have quite enough to support me <laughs> in the way I was like to have become accustomed. <laughs> so anyway, my dad said that if I would stay in New York, he'd lend me $2,000. And you could multiply it by almost 15 wow. because of the changes in economy. Uh, so I took a job in a defense fact plant design. I signed on as a draftsman hmm. uh, in Connecticut. We were designing a missile uh, in Connecticut. We'd take the train to Connecticut every day. And Betty worked in the hospital. We were saving to go to South Carolina. But my dad got tired of seeing me, and he said, okay, I'll lend you 2000 and you go to South Carolina. Wow. So then we thought Spartanburg was too big a city to start. The smaller the city, the faster I could get known, and I had to take off right away. So Gaffney was 20 miles away. Mm. And so we were looking at two different cities, and we found a place in Gaffney and set up there. Wow. Well, we hope you enjoyed that interview with the founder of Sherman College, Dr. Tom Gilardi. This is Dr. Liam Schubel signing off with my good friends, Dr. Frankie Hahn and Dr. Judd O'Grady. 
and we'll see you next time on the Shubal Vision Elite exclusive interview.